Hello everyone, thanks for joining us for today's webinar which is about charity fraud. As you can see here, the title on the screen, Protecting Your Charity Against Fraud. My name is Matt Crichton and I'm from the ACNC's education team and joining me to present today's webinar is Jess Horry. Hello Jess. Hey Matt and hi everyone. Got a fair bit to get through so we'll um, we we'll just uh, move straight into it. Ah, actually, before we do, there's just a little bit of housekeeping to cover. If you have any questions throughout the webinar, feel free to ask them in the um, control panel of the GoToWebinar system there. There's a little uh, box that you can, in which you can ask questions. We've got a few colleagues helping us out with answering your questions. It's Alana, Michael and Bree. So send them through as they pop into your mind and we'll do our best to answer them. If we don't get around to your question, we will endeavour to send you an email response later on. Uh, we have a bit of a question and a section at the end too, so we'll take some of the uh, select questions that we do receive that we think may be of use to everyone in the audience and we'll address those at the end of the formal presentation. Also, if you're having trouble with the audio, it may be worth dialing the number to listen into the webinar as if it were a phone call. When you registered, you would have received a confirmation email and that has some instructions for calling a number and entering a code and then you can uh, listen to the webinar that way. So if you are having some audio troubles, that is often a fairly effective solution. Okie dokie, let's get on to the topic proper. So we've got a a few things to get through. Number one, we'll talk about the different types of fraud. We'll talk about uh, charities' vulnerability to fraud. We'll go over some of the duties and um, obligations that charities and the responsible people of charities have to the ACNC. We'll go through some ways to protect your charity, just some uh, practical measures and some things that you should keep in mind in thinking about how to protect your charity from fraud. And we'll wrap things up with a few quick tips at the end, the sort of important takeaways that um, will be useful to jot down. And of course, a, a question and a, an answer session as well. Now, that's enough from my voice for the moment. So I'll pass you on to Jess to just give a bit of a con give a bit of the context to this topic at this time, which as you can see on the screen is coinciding with Charity Fraud Awareness Week. Jess, can you just give us a little bit of an overview of what this is? Yeah, sure. It's an initiative that came out of the UK and it is more than 40 uh, different charity regulators, um, charities, not-for-profits and other professional bodies working together to really promote the, the anti-fraud message out there. So making sure that charities and not-for-profits are prepared to deal with fraud and it's a great opportunity. If you look at the bottom of our screen here, you can see a link to the um, the hub there, which has amazing, some amazing materials. So I'd highly recommend getting on, checking it out because it's a good opportunity to get perspectives from a whole range of different um, regulators on ways you can prevent, identify and mitigate um, char fraud against charities. So yes. definitely worth checking out. And that link is, that URL is quite a long one there. So if you don't have time to scribble that one down quickly, never mind, we are going to send a follow-up email to everyone who's registered for the webinar. And that'll include all the links that we mentioned in this webinar anyway. So you, you can jot it down if you want, but of course you can um, leave it for later. And it, yeah, it is it's definitely worth checking out. Um, charity Fraud Awareness Week has a few aims to, to raise awareness of charity fraud. Uh, importantly, to share good practice, and that's where the that's where the relevance of all the different types of stakeholders comes into it, because you can really learn some uh, important things from uh, people in other but but related fields. Helps charities understand risks. An important one there, Jess. Yeah, that's exactly right. I think, you know, understanding the risks and particularly as, uh, you know, life is changing at the moment, particularly with COVID and the way the world is operating, the risks are changing. So being on top of that and being aware of what's going on is that this is a good opportunity for us all to get together and talk about how that might be affecting the charity sector. For sure. And of course, to promote honesty and openness is important. And it's based on three core messages this year. Be fraud aware. Take time. Yeah, take yeah, go ahead, Jess. <laughs> Sorry, Matt. Uh, it's take time to check and keep your charity safe. That second one is uh, particularly important because we're all busy and we all have lots of things to do, uh, particularly 
people in charities that have um, you know taking on many roles and, and doing lots of things at once that taking time to check is, is a good reminder for everyone absolutely and before we do move on I think it is worth um, we've got a, a definition of fraud here but Jess you touched on um, the effects of the pandemic and you mentioned how everything has changed and it certainly has and we're all feeling it in in a number of ways it, I think it's important just to uh, take a moment at the beginning to talk about how this affects fraud in particular and some of the, the practical applications I suppose for people working in charities yeah, I guess one of the things we have to think about when um, we do have such big changes and um, the pandemic is obviously changing, it's changing not just obviously how people are interacting, but how we work. So now lots of people are working from home, working remotely. Um, so that will change how we identify types of risks, how we interact, how we keep records. But also there's a lot of pressure on charities to pivot and change to adapt to the uh, pandemic, you know, how, what kind of outputs are they putting, you know, contributing, how the pressure of losing volunteer workforce, uh, all those kind of different things will change how you are able to cope or manage the fraud in your organisation. So I think it's a good opportunity with a week like Charity Fraud Awareness Week for us all to kind of reflect on those changes in our organisations and how we're managing fraud now in the changing environment. So that for me, I think is kind of key. This is a really good opportunity for us to all take that time and, and review what we're doing and how we could, you know, improve things to make sure that we're not um, subject to, you know, fraud in the future. Exactly. And it's not that the pandemic itself presents any particular vulnerabilities for fraud, but it is the mass disruption, I suppose. Stability is a great uh, environment in which to you know make sure everything's right and be on top of all your risks and all of that sort of thing but something like this and, and all the knock-on effects that you have just pointed out point to quite a lot of disruption for charities and that's where some gaps can appear or you can lose sight of uh, you know, some of the important processes and, and checks that you need to do to, to keep on top of risks and, and um, vulnerabilities. Yeah, it can be as simple as, you know, requiring a signature, you know, of, often charities will have, you know, double signatures on papers to make sure that things are approved at multiple levels. Now you'll have electronic signatures running around because there's no one there in the office. How are you keeping track of who signed what, where the approvals are? You know, there's all kinds of just complications that come from these type of changes. All right. Now, within that context, let's have a look at some of the other um, sort of broader foundational stuff to do with charity fraud. Um, Jess, this is from a fraud guide that we've got, um, a, a fairly decent, succinct definition of what we're talking about today. Yeah, as everyone can see on the screen, it's the fraud is a form of dishonesty where someone acts in a dishonest way so that they can receive a benefit or someone else experiences a loss. And that other person could be the charity itself or a beneficiary or someone an individual inside the charity so and there are a few ways this can happen yeah there's a variety of different ways you know we can see people commit fraud in different ways making false representations abusing their position failing to disclose information or using other forms of deception so we might just um Go back to them, just touch on a couple of these because I think we have a, a common view of uh, fraud in all our minds, but sometimes some of these uh, less obvious ones may slip our minds when we're thinking about this, um, particularly if you're involved in a charity. Something like failing to disclose information is one that uh, people may not necessarily connect with their typical idea of fraud. Isn't that right, Jess? Yeah, I think that's one of those ones that people don't understand might be ways that people can, um, you know, get a benefit without failing to disclose certain information um, about, you know, related parties they're involved in, what's their actual interest and, you know, failing to provide information is a good way of deceiving people, so, of deceiving them by omission. Yeah, right. And of course, fraud can have a negative effect on a charity's reputation and 
proud, pro proudly, <laughs> profoundly, sorry, profoundly affects staff, volunteers and board or committee members. So it's one thing just to think about the bottom line and maybe some money that went missing as part of fraud, but also that longer term knock on effect of re reputation damage. Absolutely. I mean, we've seen it time and time again with the charity sector and I'm sure across other sectors where it's the main headline that gets the big flash and that's what people remember. They don't remember the work that was done, you know, to fix the problem or all the other aspects of it. And having that kind of association of fraud associated with the charity does impact on what kind of um, donations you're going to get into the future. So it can have a really broad impact and uh, on how a charity can operate long term. Yeah, and it's, it's one that can take a long time to recover from because people do, if, if you do have that ne negative connotation with the, the charity name, as you point out, that's the headline and that's often the thing that sticks. So despite the great work a charity might do to um, identify the fraud, f fix it, flush it out and all of that, in some respects, it still doesn't quite live up to the main negative headline that hit at the beginning. So it's really important to think about the long-term consequences of this beyond just the single incident. And maybe in this case, a good example of prevention being far, far better than cure. Yeah, always. <laughs> and fraud and other, other types of financial crime, I suppose, as it says here, can be classed as either internal or external. We'll go over uh, both of these uh, classifications, I suppose, in the next couple of slides. First, Jess, can you just give us an overview of internal fraud, what we mean by that? Well, that really is talking about someone inside or connected within the charity that is committing the fraud. So someone, a staff member, a board member, someone inside the charity is actually stealing the money <laughs> right right yeah and um that's that that can happen in in a variety of ways and we're, we're not thinking about you know someone <laughs> robbing the place of course that someone uh, no. with access to systems and and files and whatnot that's right you know maybe they put a few extra bucks from they've got control of the payroll and they're putting money into their accounts um, they're creating false invoices, as I think is on the slide there. Uh, you know, maybe they've decided to uh, put their company, related company, on the payroll by without letting anyone know. So there's all kind of different ways that that can happen. External fraud and the difference to internal fraud with, with this one. Jess, can you give us an overview? Um, yeah, external fraud is more where it's someone outside of the charity who might be making uh, the fraud against the charity. So, you know, false invoices that are trying to obtain money. Um, it can be cyber fraud, so cyber attacks. Mm -hmm. uh, those with identity fraud. So um, what we saw sometimes with the bushfires and the droughts where people are making false claims for charity funds. Right. Um, and the charity is not aware, that, you know, that they're not who they say they are. Right, right. And I suppose just tying back to the current situation and uh, everyone working remotely with um, the, the pandemic still prevalent, this is something, this is, I suppose, a vulnerability. As you mentioned, there may be fewer people, fewer resources. People aren't in the office together to talk about different things or have invoices or financial statements checked over by another. Sometimes these situations can lead to vulnerabilities that allow some external fraud to slip through. Yeah, exactly. And I think, you know, in a situation like um, the pandemic, the type of beneficiaries who might be coming to you are going to be different to who was there in the past. You know, people who previously were well employed and had lots of money and now suddenly unemployed or don't have access to any income you suddenly are getting a different type of beneficiary as well. So it does kind of put strains on how you verify that information in circumstances where people are all online as well. So there's different, very different ways that this is going to impact on. Um, yeah. And as you say, it exposes vulnerabilities for charities. And just before we do move on just on the external, that it's important for charities to remember that this can come from a number of fronts too. So as Jess mentioned, the beneficiaries aspect and maybe people making false claims on um, grants or, or funds that they're not really entitled to, but nonetheless, they're having a go at. 
There's also things like um, contractors and third parties and your charity's supply line. Along that line too, there may be vulnerabilities that you need to um, keep in mind. So it is a difficult one in that sometimes the vulnerabilities are at quite a few different, coming from quite a few different areas. Absolutely. Now, this is an interesting question. Ch charities are unique in many ways, um, but they're, they're, not, they're not necessarily more vulnerable to fraud or financial crime than others. However, there are some aspects that makes a charity, I suppose, more attractive to, to these sorts of attacks and this sort of vulnerability. We'll go through a few of those. Uh, Jess, do you want to take on the first one here that sort of leaves charities in a particularly vulnerable position, I suppose? Yeah, I think, you know, there's a, in, within the public, there is a high level of trust and confidence in the charity sector, and that can sometimes lead to people making certain assumptions that everyone inside the charity is also trustworthy yep. and that charity, charitable organisations themselves are potentially not, you don't want to ask the questions that you might have asked if it was in a commercial setting. So people sometimes get offended if you say, oh, you know, what are you actually going to do with this money? You know, don't you trust me is the, the yeah. answer. You know, don't you trust that I'm, I'm, you know, I work and I do all this for this charity. But really it does mean that because there is sometimes a resistance to asking those questions, it can leave them a bit more exposed. A second one here, the culture too. So of course, all organisations have culture, whether that be a you know, private commercial enterprise or a charity, but you just touched on it in your last uh, comment, Jess, the, the culture is an important aspect of this as well. Yeah, absolutely. And we, and we definitely see it, you know, charities and organisations that are open and honest and are happy to be scrutinised are less likely to be subject to fraud. So where there is a culture of trust, that's great in some ways, but you also have to be, the trust has to be that you're happy to answer questions when they're asked about why, why decisions are made, why money is spent, how it's being used. And I think sometimes in these, particularly, you know, charities where everyone's working on a, you know, the smell of an oily rag, you can really find that that has a big impact on how, you know, how willing people are to scrutinise those kind of decisions. Yeah. And I think that does leave some of those organisations more vulnerable to fraud. Which touches on this one. And, and again, it seems to be running theme through today's webinar, I suppose, given the context of the pandemic. But um, this one here, small numbers of people involved. How does that make a charity particularly vulnerable, Jess? Well, yeah, as I mentioned before, we know that people in charities often carrying multiple hats, doing multiple roles, and that can sometimes leave it to like one person who's making all the financial decisions. Yeah. And we know that fraud and often people who make decisions to commit fraud are people who are in financially pressured situations and they might make decisions that they normally wouldn't. Um, and it's often about opportunity. So if you have one person who's making all the financial decisions, has all the access to all the finances, it, it becomes much easier for them to, to commit fraud and it gives them the opportunity. So one of those things that we have to keep an eye on is making sure that you do have that multiple sign off and it's not just, um, you know, you're the person next to you, but actually having kind of clear guidelines on who can sign off on what kind of decisions, um, making sure that, you know, we know where, where funds are being um, spent and we're tracking and monitoring those. So I think that's really important for um, making sure that fraud doesn't occur. And at a time like this, uh, it's really important to not succumb to that very, uh, very easy temptation to write it off as an extraordinary time and we'll get back to normal later. So we'll just, you know, we'll turn a blind eye to some of the shortcuts we're taking at the moment just to get through while we're low on staff and funding's low and that sort of thing, because that's a very easy way to do things in this um, sort of situation. So it is important to recognise where you may be lacking in resources to be able to do things um, as you may have done previously and take the time to figure out ways to still uh, put those checks and balances in place with the current resourcing that you've got. And that means there's less, 
there's less likelihood that you're going to leave those vulnerabilities um, vulnerable for for a long time just to get through this this time now to to get through it until we're back to a normal state of affairs. Yeah, absolutely. I think one of the things that is the key with people, particularly working from home, and and, and where you are making changes to processes because you've had to adapt to the new environment is keeping records of all this all these decisions that are being made and why you're making them so obviously we're all working online a lot more so that means more emails and keeping track of those emails and keeping those records is going to be extremely important kind of make sure that you can keep track of why decisions are made and as Matt said keep checking don't don't think that this is an opportunity to stop checking this is an opportunity to make sure that you are checking and you've got ways to keep checking. Yeah. Now, funding's uh, something that's um, probably unique to the charity sector or in the types of uh, funding challenges that it has, and this poses some vulnerabilities. Yeah, irregular cash flow means that it is difficult to kind of be able to identify where funds go missing here and there because that becomes is part of the pattern of it particularly a small charity where there's lots of irregular payments and different types of re even revenue coming in and out. Um, so obviously in other sectors you don't necessarily have so much uh, variation in how much income or um, output is going through so you just does make it a bit more difficult for charities to pick up or to identify where something odd has happened and again I mean not to go harp on about the pandemic but you know Prior to the pandemic, we had the bushfires where a record amount of money was coming into the sector. Then we have the pandemic, and then obviously that just caused a big impact on a large range of charities. So you can see even that in itself, those kind of ups and downs of disasters have a greater impact on the charity sector than others. And that can make it really difficult to pick up where there has been maybe some funny business in the financial actions. Okay, we'll move on to some um, responsibilities now and duties and, and certain obligations that charities and the people involved in charities have. And before we get on to some obligations specific to the ACNC, we will touch on some other bodies because, yes, of course, the ACNC can do some things, but it can't do everything. And there are other <laughs> agencies or bodies that are involved in certain actions. Yeah, so obviously fraud is a criminal offence. So the first place you need to go is to the police, and and making sure that you're you know lodging that with the police is the important thing at this point to stop that activity occurring into the future. So that's the first point of call. Um, as is on the slide, we can also talk to your bank to make sure that funds aren't being misused that way, um, and that charity bank accounts have the right PIP signatures on them to stop. Yep. Um, credit cards and other accounts being misused in that way. So there, there's some really practical things I would get straight onto as soon as you know or even suspect that there could be some fraud occurring in your charity. Yeah, and there are other government... Uh, yeah, so... Sorry, Matt, go. No, yeah, that's all right. So you can, once, once you've done those immediate things, if, you, if it's to the point where you have to contact the police, um, also you may want to think about the government bodies that cover certain actions such as the ACCC's uh, program Scam Watch and reporting fraudulent behaviour to state or, or territory consumer regulators and that differs in each state and they may have different jurisdictions, the the actions and, and the sort of uh, the wrongdoing that it can look at may differ between each state and territory but certainly um, it's worth uh, looking at those government agencies as well. Yeah, I was just going to say that Scamwatch is a great resource, uh, particularly for cybercrime, if you're experiencing those kind of um, phishing um, activities. Uh, make sure you get those reported to Scamwatch because they're actually doing, you know, they're in the background being able to alert people to the type of um, schemes that are going on out there. So Yeah, absolutely. Because it, sort of a public service announcement too. So if it's happened to your charity and it's reported to Scamwatch, it's likely to show up there on the Scamwatch website and other people can learn from it and look out for some of the indicators that it may be happening to them as well. Yeah. Okay. Um, now, the ACNC's obligations, Jess, do you want to quickly run over some of these? 
Yeah, so I think we're just starting off here with the obligation to notify of uh, um, the ACNCA where a breach has occurred. I guess if you have had experience fraud in your organisation, potentially that's because there has been a failure in some aspect of your governance. There might be a policy that wasn't really up to date, um, there was maybe a procedure that wasn't working, or you know, some uh, you know, decisions were being made that weren't really in the best interest of the charity. So those are all indicators that there might be a breach of obligations to the ACNC, and the best thing you can do is notify us as soon as possible or within 28 days of becoming aware of the breach. That, that allows us to kind of keep on top and make sure that if we're finding about it, out about the fraud in um, the newspaper, we, we already know that you're on top of it, what you're doing to, to, to that you know that there's problems in your governance and taking steps to fix it. It's a really good way of keeping us on the front foot um, rather than us having to react to a, a bad media report. So I really recommend if you are or do find that you have experienced fraud in your organisation, get online and let us know by submitting the Judicial Notify form. And just to, I suppose, allay some fears that that may um, foster in some people, that doing so doesn't necessarily put a big black mark next to your charity or, or a line through it on a list or anything like that, does it just? No, not at all. In fact, it's probably a, a more like a tick against your name. If we think that people are being proactive with their obligations, the ACNC, and have recognised, because, you know, no fraud policy is ever going to be 100%. You know, you need to be able to adapt and change, as, as we said. And um, for us, a charity knowing that they need to let us know where, this, where things have gone wrong is often an opportunity us to, to us for us to know that you're on the right track. So from a compliance point of view, and that's where I, I view all these um, issues, is that's really for us a positive step the charity's taking because they are aware that there have been mistakes made. And that means that they're at least ready to fix those mistakes. Yep. Okay, reporting an incident, as it says here, is one of the ways to demonstrate that your charity's board or committee members um, are dealing with the issue appropriately. And that's what that notification is, is really getting at the heart of. Okay, I'll move on to some of the protections now for charities. <coughs> Sorry, got my, my, my voice caught up there. Um, so we've got a, a number of things to get through here, some, some tips and practical steps to help people protect their charity from fraud. Let's uh, set the context, um, it's important to consider uh, three things here, Jess. We, we've got them listed on the screen. Do you want to take us through these? Yes, sure. So what we think is really important is the, having an ethical culture, ensuring that there's good communication flow and that you really have those policies and procedures in place to, um, to build it all together. We say an ethical culture, and um, one of the things is to be clear about a charity's values. And that means not just knowing them and sort of having them passively exist somewhere, maybe in the constitution, in a folder, in a cupboard, collecting dust, but talk about them often and model them in your behaviour. And that doesn't have to be in big actions and big projects all the time. It can be just the daily stuff that helps um, helps set the culture within the organisation. There are a few key points to doing this, Jess. Yeah, so I think, you know, as you said, <clears throat> excuse me, it's about modelling them. So setting the tone from the top, getting, making sure you have clear expectations for everyone within the charity, what's expected in regards to their disclosures, their behaviours, things like that, what we're, what your charity is working towards. Um, a no blame culture, that means it allows people to raise their hand when things go wrong or they've made a mistake and that allows charities to fix them before things, you know, rather than people trying to hide their mistakes and that's really an important way of improving your governance. Um, promote fairness, so that means that people don't feel like they're going to be, <clears throat> that, you know, Joe Blow is going to get a job over Joe, um, next guy because of the, you know who he who he knows or because he's been friend, he goes for drinks with somebody else that that changes then that can build resentment within an organization um and also you know promote 
and protect <coughs> excuse me sorry protect whistleblowers so there's obviously legislation out there about whistleblowers but it's really important that people feel that they can raise concerns that that that, that can go you know to be protected and they're not going to be yep. um impacted by that yeah I'll, I'll let you get yourself a drink of water there jess and of course actually there is um just mentioned the legislation about whistleblowers we will include a link to some information about that in the follow-up email to to this one um important for a charity to be open about the possibility of fraud even if the risk is low so the people involved in the charity sh should know what fraud is, know how it can occur, know how it typically does occur, particularly um, with charities and the unique vulnerabilities that we went through earlier will be a good starting point for this. And it's important to realise that although you may be confident in your organisation's ability to prevent fraud and um, even deal with it if, it, if it if it may pop up in small um, cases it's important to know that your charity isn't immune to it and it needs the people involved need to take the threat seriously even if they think it's highly unlikely yeah I think this is like where risk assessments are really important you know understanding what are the risks that your charity faces um, and then you can be confident that you have mitigations and and things in place to protect it. But you can never have zero you know, risk of fraud. It's just not possible. There's always ways that people can get around um, various policies, procedures, protections, but it's good to be aware of where your vulnerabilities are so you can put in place the necessary protections to you know, make sure that you are less likely to be subject to fraud. And this is a real practical um, point here. So just bringing the abstract and the good ideas into something that charities can and should actually do. Two points here, Jess just mentioned one with the risk assessment and then regular reviews. So what does this mean just in practice for a charity? Um, the risk assessment, how often, how many topics, how, how should it look? And then the regular reviews, weekly and what sort of procedures? What, what are we sort of talking about here? Yeah, I mean, it really depends on the type of charity you have and your size and complexity. I mean, I would expect that you would have a risk assessment um, in place for all charities, and that doesn't have to be a major big document. It can be as, as small as one page and getting everyone to sit down if it's your small organisation or if you're larger, maybe just those in the finance and from different departments and going through and, and kind of testing what are the risks of fraud? Where are the kind of the touch points where that could occur? Brainstorming those out and making sure you have thought through all of those risks and thinking about ways that you can prevent that happening. So it's a fairly, it doesn't have to be a big complicated document. It can just be quite simple and then you can find where there are gaps and that will help you um, fix those gaps in the future. The other side of how regular, again, it does depend on your size and complexity. I think we've already mentioned it a number of times, you know, with the time, with the current changes in place, and I know that obviously charities are probably stretched at the moment, but it is a good time to be thinking about reviewing your risk assessments because there are changes that we, you need to um, be considering now that we're obviously most people are working online or <clears throat> Uh, remotely I think you know how regular that is you wouldn't be wanting to leave it for too long I mean because obviously you need to keep adapting to the changing circumstances so things that might require you to change your risk assessment is or suddenly an increase in income or a decrease in income mm. you take on a new activity you might want to review your risk assessment then so it does really depend on your your charity and what kind of activities actions and size you are but you need to be thinking um, when was the last time we looked at our risks? Have we done anything different or new since we last did it? And then be considering, well, if those are yeses, then you need to to be looking at reviewing your risk assessment. Absolutely. I think that point sort of sums it up in a way, the new thing. Are you doing anything new or has something in the environment changed that may cause a need to look at a procedure or a policy again. No doubt charities will have lots of procedures and policies that don't say anything about working from home and a pandemic and, and all that sort of thing. So that's a good example of 
of course, that's a, this is a major global event, but nonetheless, it's an event that has caused changes within a charity that should prompt it to just think about the processes by which they operate and how they stand up to the demands of, of the current working environment. Okay, now, identifying the types of fraud, this is sort of the, the idea of the red flag. And yeah, that's what charities should think about if they're even trying to get their head around this from step one. Yeah, so what they really need to do is look at the different risks that they present from, firstly, their activities, those roles and people inside their charity, and what are their banking procedures and fundraising methods, how do they make decisions about who gets paid, you know, who has access to, you know, the charity's credit card, are there controls in place for that, how that money is used. So I guess it's looking at how your what your charity does, who does what and then what are the money and how is the money used inside the charity? They're the three things. Yep. Understand the red flags comes in different, I suppose, sections or different or working um, areas for a charity and then we'll have a look at stuff for finances now. So these may be some of the red flags and these are the sorts of things that um, we may see or, or other um, agencies may see in investigating issues. Yes, yeah, so the first there is altered, deleted or missing records. And I, I've already kind of touched on the importance of record keeping, but that is a really um, a kind of a red flag that if you suddenly realise that there are records missing, that might suggest that there's something going wrong. Uh, duplicate payments or unexplained or unusual transactions. And we talked previously about the fact that charities do have this irregular kind of um, often have irregular payment structures, but if you're seeing something that doesn't make sense, then you should be asking questions. Unexpected invoice or budget variances. So obviously most charities are putting in place a budget. You know, it's going to be variances because of changes to how um, to the environment. But you should also be taking steps to make sure that those variances are appropriate. Irregularities identified through an audit. So yeah, your auditors are a great source of picking up um, potential issues. Obviously, a lot of people rely on their auditors as their fraud prevention. And I just would make the point that that's just one way and it's not necessarily the best way of preventing fraud. Um, they're just, they have uh, one job to do and that's to make sure that the money is spent as it was, you know, as the charity intended. But it doesn't mean that they'll necessarily pick up fraud. And the last is reconciliation, not completing regular or checked for discrepancies. So those making sure that those money that went out is reconciled and that people are making doing that that checking, as we said, yep. very important. Yeah, great point about the audits. It, it definitely isn't your sole defence against fraud and don't think of it like that. It's another layer um, in some cases, maybe the final layer before getting stuff signed off, but certainly not the only thing your charity should be relying on. And now moving on from finances, some of the red flags for behaviour and this in some respects can be much more difficult to pinpoint because you don't have you know, line items to add up to make sure they equal the total and all that sort of thing. It's much more abstract. Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, what you see when fraud has happened in charities, it's often is someone inside the charity who may have even been there for years and years and um, suddenly they come across a hard time and they have the means and opportunity to, you know, solve their financial personal problems by putting some money aside for themselves. And that kind of is a real way that can um, charities can get into trouble. And it touches on that point we made earlier about I suppose one of the particular vulnerabilities of a charity, given the nature of the work and in some respects the, the, the passion involved in the people taking on the work means that there may be this um, level of trust that I suppose prevents some of the more critical or, or um, the scrutiny that may come in other contexts. So uh, here are some examples. One person with sole control of financial processes. Um, Jess, for this one, I'd imagine there are a lot of smaller charities that do have this set up exactly as we've described, but we've called it a red flag here. Yeah, I think it's one of those things where you find that that person um, is 
you know, in charge of all the decisions because they're probably the person with the best experience in finances. But I think it really is best practice for all charities to have someone else who actually at least understands the financial systems that you've got in place. Relying on one person to make all those decisions, while it might be the most um, cost effective way, is not necessarily the best way for ensuring charities are protected from fraud so even though that you might trust that person implicitly it's good to have someone else who at least understands what the financial systems how the financial systems work and can go in and check and 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 take over where that person is on leave or if something happens to them it's good to have another person who at least understands that systems yep the second one i think we're all familiar with in your daily life um, in our experiences vague responses to legitimate queries is often a red flag um, uh, yeah, absolutely. The third one, actually, because I, I think we've, we've got a, uh, an innate understanding of why that would be a red flag, that second one. But the third one here is curious. Yeah, yeah. Reluctance to accept help or take holidays as a red flag. Yeah, I mean, I think this is, I guess, going back to the first point where you have a sole person in charge. If that person just is not wanting to take holidays, it might be because they don't want to hand over or show someone else how to... Um, to use the financial system because they want to hide the fat behavior that they're doing so it's a good way if if someone is refusing holidays and they have that sole charge then i would be really making sure that you have someone else come in and understand how the system works because you know that's the kind of way that people can hide fraud quite significantly yeah and the last one uh, i suppose is an extension of that in many mm -hmm. respects delays to work reviews or audits yeah that's right Okay. When looking at the risk indicators, there are some things that we think it's really important for people involved in charities to remember. Um, the typical fraud perpetrator is a paid employee. Now, that's interesting. I think we think of fraud as an external problem. We're not thinking of it as occurring within the organisation, but uh, reality suggests that's not the case, Jess. Yeah, I think and we've touched on a few different types of examples of that where, you know, people inside the charity have the access, the means, and, you know, it doesn't take much for them to um, to make some wrong decisions and end up being a perpetrator of fraud. Yeah, that's right. Oh, it's easiest, I suppose, if you've got all the access and and you know everything, it, it, is, it is the easiest path, isn't it? Not that we're trying to yeah. um, lull people into this sense of, paranoia by their, their distrust of all their colleagues, I think it's just um, common sense to employ some element of um, critical critical assessment or, or scrutiny to, to the processes of the workplace. And um, the most common types of fraud, cash theft, payroll or credit card fraud, and we've touched on a fair bit of uh, how this can happen uh, so far, particularly with records and if we're thinking about prevention rather than cure, just then record keeping is hard to understate when thinking about the uh, payroll and credit card type theft. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, having policies on how you use credit cards is, is crucial for that kind of thing. I think cash theft is, is a really difficult one for charities where you are, you know, involved in, in collecting cash and dealing with cash. It's really hard to put you know, appropriate controls in place. Um, I mean, obviously, you can do things like having two people there. So there's not just one person with all the cash um, counting, double counting and things like that. But I mean, probably less of a problem in today's world where, where we're you know, not doing so much face to face fundraising. But yeah, there's um, each of those have their you know, ways you can control. But record keeping is number one always. Yeah, and the third point here, it may it may sound almost glib, but it really is true. Having internal financial controls is one of the most effective ways. And the funny thing with this is, is it's so easy in one respect because you just have to just take the time, as one of the, the, the core tenets of this year's Charity Fraud Awareness Week suggests, take the time to set up the um, set up the right uh, steps or processes or controls, and then they should go a long way to protect your organisation from fraud. Yeah, I mean, we hear it a bit in compliance. Well, it's just paperwork. What's it, what's it, the value when we've got other more important work to do? And I guess what we always say is it's crucially important because you don't want really hard-earned charity funds to be 
put into someone else's private pocket and not going towards the beneficiaries. You know, this is some, they don't have to be complicated. They, in fact, better if they're not. The policy, sim more simple the policy, the better and more effective it probably is. Yep. You need to have policies and procedures that people are actually following. And then those are the best ways to stop your charity being misused. Okay, as we say here, develop sound written policies and procedures. Um, as, as Jess points out, th these don't need to be novels. And in fact, it's better if they're not because that last point Jess made, people need to be following these. They need to know where they are, read them and understand them easily and refer to them when carrying out their daily duties. So detailed and robust financial procedures, a broad prevention policy and human resources procedures. It may sound intimida intimidating, these sorts of documents, but Jess, they really don't have to be as complicated as the words make them sound. No, absolutely. I mean, we say detailed and robust, but what we're talking about is so people know where things are recorded, when money can come out, who can make decisions, you know, those kind of, those are the details that really matter. And making sure you have, when we're talking about robust, we're talking about checks and balances put in place so that, that people are checking on those those financial transactions. They are monitoring to make sure things don't go wrong. There doesn't have to be a complicated process. It just has to be that you have thought through what are each of the steps for financial transactions or financial um, payments that your charity makes and how are you making sure that the, the money is going to the right place. So it's not, it doesn't have to be complicated. And really it's, as I said before, really it's better that you are using them, that they're, they're usable policies. Anything that is too detailed, too long, people are going to ignore it and they're going to skip steps and they're not going to do it right. So better to do something that's effective and um, then, then something that is, you know, perfect, I guess. Yeah. So don't put your, don't write big long cop policies and then put them on the shelf and never look at them again. The mo main thing is to make sure that you have something in place that is something that your charity will actually use and is fit for purpose for your charity. Yep, exactly. That brings us to the, I suppose, most of the, the formal content today being done. We're just going to run through some steps to remember, some key points to take away. So Jess, I'll get you to take us through the first two. If people haven't been um, paying as much attention so far, <laughs> they can switch on now and get some of the most important takeaways uh, from today's webinar. Numbers one and two, Jess. Yeah, so number one, keep those clear written financial procedures and delegations. And when we're talking about delegations is who can spend how much and when and what for. So pretty straightforward stuff, but if you don't have them in place, it's easy for people to bend the rules a little bit and before you know you're in big trouble. Absolutely. Number two. That's really, just to, before we get to number two, that's a really important point because it might say the process is, you know, so-and-so has to sign off on this and so-and-so has to use this credit card for this type of thing. Yeah, get into the details about at what level can what amount of funds be processed by this person and, and who needs to sign off on more funds and that sort of thing can often be missed, um, but they are really important to have in clear written procedures. Sorry, move on to number two. <laughs> That's all right. Thanks, Matt. Okay, uh, next is robust human resources procedures. So that is giving people an opportunity to know, you know, when they see something wrong, who do they report it to? How do they report it? Um, what's the impact if they don't meet, they do do something wrong, like spend money on a credit card for a personal use? What's the impact of all those different decisions? What's the charity's code of conduct for, the, what are their expectations of how those employees or volunteers should behave and those kind of protections will allow you to protect your charity from you know people making bad decisions and you feeling like you've you've endorsed it by not giving them a clear instruction yeah exactly the code of conduct thing um display it and embody it and, and this is really important in embedding the the culture that you want in your charity and doing this is an easy way of having it run right through the organisation. As we said earlier in the webinar, though, it is important that it starts at the top. And the embody part of this is really crucial. Putting up posters is one good way. <laughs> but if the people aren't going to follow 
the code of conduct and, and the values um, that your charity stands for, then the posters and the slogans aren't going to go as far as they should. Number four, financial responsibility. Make sure it's shared and transparent. And this does even apply to smaller charities. We know that uh, many smaller charities lack the resources that larger charities have. So it is hard to share some of the responsibilities, but within your capability to do so, it's worth sharing them around so that there are protections in place on, on the use of funds and the procedures that um, control the charity's funds and resources. And the last one here, just the transparency is important because people should be should know what the processes are and should be able to should have ready access to policies and procedures that explain to them what they are. So if they need to find out, they can. And there's no hiding. Numbers five and six, Jess. Yeah, so limit stuff and volunteers cash handling, as I mentioned before, it's really cash is a hard way, um, hard to manage fraud for because you can't um, you know, there's n the record keeping is less um, in less available because you're dealing with cash. So if we can limit how much staff and volunteers have access to cash, that's always going to be um, a good way to go. Six is monitor the charity's budget and bank accounts and keep track of grant funding. So making sure that you are seeing the ins and outs, both in your budget, your, your accounts, and so you can account for the grants funding and how you've used it is really important you know um, that way that you can just pick up something early rather than waiting till the end of a project and finding out that all these funds have gone yep. to the wrong area and just finally number seven take the time to check so even though we're in an environment where everyone's busy everyone's doing multiple things at the same time and struggling to find the time to to get lots of things done it really is important to take the time to check, ask questions and don't take anything for granted and encourage the culture of asking at your organisation, at your charity. Number eight, understand the importance of reporting fraud. As Jess mentioned earlier, there is a duty to notify the ACNC in certain circumstances and that doesn't necessarily put a black mark against the charity's name. It actually um, indicates that the charity is taking it's governance processes seriously and it's something that they should do. And it's not just to the ACNC, it's any instance of fraud that is that can be reported to other authorities as well, whether that be as serious as the police or to another government agency at the state level, it's important to do so. Okay, we have had a few good questions coming. I know that we are sort of running out of time, so we'll get through a couple of quick ones. Um, uh, oops. That's the end. Um, I've got a couple here, Jess, that you may be able to help us out with. There's a question I, um, that may be useful for everyone. If someone's asked if it's still fraud to use charity credit cards or funds, for that matter, I suppose, for personal purposes, if there's a promise to pay the charity back. Uh, I'm not sure if the, the promise would be in writing or of a verbal promise, but nonetheless, <laughs> the concept there. Is, is, that, is that still fraud? Um, it really does depend on the context because if you have a credit card policy where staff are given personal credit cards that they can use for the charity purposes, but they have to pay for their own funds in the end, so they have to account for it. So that could be a way that you say is a promise that you will pay it back, set up clearly in the credit card policy that you can buy some personal expenses, but you will reimburse the charity. That is potentially not fraud. I think it's a really dangerous area to go down because Obviously, credit card um, have interest rates and you're getting a bit, of, bit of much a, a free loan from the charity by not having to pay for the credit card fees and all the other things. So you need to be careful about making those kind of expenses. I think even paying it back is um, not necessarily going to stop you from being subject to fraud. So yeah. you need to follow the policies, make sure you have policies in place about how credit cards can be used and when who can get paid when and how much they can use for personal expenses. Um, there's another, there's one here that's sort of on a similar note, I suppose. It's something that you sort of just touched on in the answer. Is it fraud? Someone's asked if it's fraud if a charity approves something that it shouldn't. Uh, an example being maybe a board or committee collectively approves spending on something that, that it really shouldn't because it's for the benefit of the board. Yeah, I think this is a, um, a tricky one. I think you might not find that it's fraud against 
the charity itself because the FM board is making the decision. It might be private benefit and therefore not charitable decision making and definitely not good governance. Uh, where, where it could be potentially fraud is where it's relating to a government funding um, agreement or something like that where the funds are actually provided to the charity for another purpose. Right. If it's inside the charity, whether it falls under the definition of fraud or not is a little bit more complicated if the board has approved it but then the question comes down are they the board misusing charity funds for private benefit and therefore are they not actually acting charitably and then in the best interest of the charity yeah. and that for us would be a significant serious issue that we would be taking serious action for yeah right so even if it doesn't necessarily fit a strict legal definition of fraud for the purposes of um you know law enforcement it certainly is a problem for governance and, and something that the ACNC would, would be concerned about. Absolutely. And there's a couple more. We might, we've got time for one more, I suppose. Um, oh, this is an interesting one, just moving from those examples to things we've spoken about um, today with regards to the current environment. But can charities have different approaches to fraud in different situations. So for example, it may be harder to be right on top of all fraud in the midst of an emerging disaster. Can, can they sort of shift their fraud protection up and down according to the environment? It's a complicated one, I think, because say for example, you're in the middle of um, a disaster and you need to get funds out to people quickly, you might need to be a little bit more flexible in your fraud or you know procedures at that point just for the speed of getting money to people in need you need to really understand um, in those circumstances what is the tolerance for fraud in those kind of situations for your charity and you need to have that clearly documented i think in most circumstances you you need to make sure that the the fraud prevention is in place but there can be circumstances i can see where it's an emerging disaster and you need to get money out quick or there's some kind of urgent decisions that need to be made but really this is where record keeping is 100 percent required because you need to be making sure that those decisions are accountable you're keeping records of why you're making those decisions why you're deciding to take a different um approach to fraud at in those circumstances i think it's really important that charities have a very clear indication of how much fraud they're prepared you know what's their fraud tolerance and um how that's impacted by things like you know emergency disasters and things like that um this is i think an area that is complicated i'm sure i wish i could give a more straightforward answer but i do think it does come down to being clear about what's your you know sense of um, fraud tolerance in your charity and keeping records of why you're making those decisions if you are deciding to be a bit more lax on your fraud policies. Yeah, and that's the important thing in record keeping. And just to clarify though, but when we say fraud tolerance, we're not talking about willingly seeing fraud and not reporting it. We're talking about tolerance for the risk that fraud could come about, right? Yeah, thanks. <laughs> that's no, that's clarification. <laughs> yeah. No, what we're talking about is that, yeah, you're prepared to risk more that fraud could be occurring because you are more focused on ensuring that those in need get the money, all the resources that they need at that point in time. So, um, you yeah, know, that's, I think, the differentiation there. Yeah, yeah. And, and record keeping, record keeping. If you've got the documents, then that's, that goes a long way. Okay. And it might be that you, yeah. sorry, Matt, just one more point to that. I just want to clarify also, you might be something that you're prepared to wear the risk at the front end, but go back to try and recover or check later on. So it might be, okay, well, we'll wear this risk now with the idea that we're going to go back and recheck this later on when the when the need isn't so great yeah. um, and you know take the necessary actions at that point, report it to the police, whatever you think is necessary, if you think you have been subject to a fraudulent claim. Great. Well, that brings us to the end of today's webinar. Thank you very much for everyone who's hung around this phone and is still with us. We hope you got a lot out of it. If you have a few moments 
at the end of the webinar to uh, complete a very, very short survey. I think it's only two, uh, three questions. So if you've got 25 seconds to do that, we get a lot out of the survey at the end. That would be appreciated. Also, we've got lots of web guidance on a range of topics, particularly the ones that we touched on today on our website. Sign up for the charitable purpose e-monthly newsletter if you're on the website. Um, that's a great way to hear about news in the sector and the ACNC and well, a range of things to do with, with charities. Our webinars are all on the website. If you've missed a few uh, previously, you can go watch videos there. The podcast has chats about uh, chats with experts about some important topics for charities. And, of course, if you've got any queries, send us an email, advice at acnc.gov.au. And we're fairly active on social media too, and there are our main uh, channels there. So thanks very much for hanging around, everyone. Thanks to um, everyone who... Uh, well, thanks to our colleagues who are able to answer the questions for everyone. And we hope you got a lot out of it today. And we hope that you take on some of the resources for Charity Fraud Awareness Week and use them for your charity. Thanks for presenting today, Jess. My pleasure. Everyone check out the hashtag Charity Fraud Out. Thanks. Yes, please do. Okay, well, that concludes our session today. Um, we will be closing off the webinar and we hope you have a good day. Thanks for joining us. Goodbye, everyone.